Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends Podcast, the podcast designed to help you feel, see, and think differently about the podiatry profession. Before I introduce my amazing guest today, I want to remind everybody that my next 12-week podiatry business reboot is kicking off on the 8th of February. It's only about a month away. So if you've been sitting on the fence, getting splinters in your bum, thinking about it, and you're not sure, go to my website, tysonfranklin.com. All the information's on there, and you can make a wise decision. So with me today is Bart Stenhouse. He is a recent 2022 graduate from Southern Cross University. And I think you're going to, this episode is going to blow your mind because he works, well, he is going to be working between Adelaide and Brisbane. Yes, two capital cities in Australia. He's not going to be located just in one place. He's going to be doing permanent part-time work in both locations. So if you've never considered that as a career option, uh, this might just open up your eyes. So, Bart, how are you doing today? I'm great, Tyson. Great to talk to you. And anyone who's watching the video at the moment, if you're listening to this on audio, you won't be able to tell that Bart is holding a guitar. If you're watching the video, it's very obvious that there's a guitar and mine is in the background, which I probably will not be picking up because Bart is a professional musician and I'm a podiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> so how about how we connected was Bart listened to the episode I did, episode 109, and it was titled Understanding Biomechanics by Using Guitar Chords. And because Bart is a professional musician, he that really resonated with him. He reached out to me and said, oh, I really enjoyed that particular episode. And I said, well, let's come on the show because I want to find out how did someone who was a professional musician for 20 years decide to become a podiatrist? So got to ask the question, what made you decide to do podiatry and give up the glamorous world <laughs> of music? Or well, you haven't given it up. You're doing both. Yeah, doing both. Um, that's a great question. Uh, originally, it basically stemmed from reviewing my life in music and going, I love this, but I can't buy a house with it. And I really want to uh, live in my own place. And, you know, the same aspirations a lot of other people have. So I was talking with a friend of mine who's an orthodist and his wife who I used to teach guitar to. And they said, hey, we know this profession that you should check out. We think you'd be perfect for it. And they said, just go have a look. It's podiatry. Do you know what a podiatrist is? And I was like, no, what's a podiatrist? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good start. Uh, yeah, so I went and looked into it and um, they said, yes, I was living in Northern New South Wales at the time. And they said, Southern Cross Uni offers a course in podiatry. Why don't you consider doing that? So I went and looked into it and I went, this is perfect for me because just the skill sets that are involved and I really wanted to do something in health uh, alongside music and something where I could bring my people skills from teaching the guitar online and face-to-face and -face for 20 years. Uh, and it was just, yeah, a really natural fit for me. So it's not you just being a musician. You yeah. were also a lecturer at the Queensland Conservatorium. Yep. So you yep. so you, teaching has been a big thing with you as well, and therefore you were doing a lot of like private lessons, teaching yep. the, just the guitar, yep. or you've got other instruments that you play as well. I uh, teach three instruments in my school, so I teach piano, guitar, and bass. Yep. Okay. We yep. had a we had a music teacher that used to come to our house and do the guitar with me, piano with my daughter, and then drums with my wife. Wow. And it was fun. And after about six, I'd already been doing it for a while before that, and then about six months into it, he said, how come you three have never played together? Wow. We all, we wow. all just looked at each other and went, I don't know. So he picked a song for us. I think it was Proud Mary. And yep. uh, we, we did that together as our first song. And it was so much fun. Yeah, awesome. So what got, what got you into music in the first place? Uh, we all, we always had a guitar kind of lying around the house uh, when I was growing up and mum kind of had, like tried to learn some folk guitar back in the probably 70s, I imagine. Yeah. And never really, you know, like did it over a summer or something, but the guitar just kind of always hung around. And I got uh, picked for, you know, the school band and things like that. And trumpet was kind of my first instrument. So I kind of played in the school band and learned classical music and um, how to read and scales and all that stuff. And, but the guitar always intrigued me. It always just sitting on the stand and it kind of called to me. And I used to go and just pick it up and, you know, do this as a, <laughs> as as a, as a nine-year-old. Yeah, yeah. Making, you know, songs out of that. 
And then I, I slowly just started picking up little by little and got some books and started teaching myself to begin with. And then went, you know what? I think I could get a lot better at this if I got a teacher. So this is when I was maybe 12 or something. So I went and got some <laughs> lessons and kind of went from there. And it's just been a, a, a constant process of uh, learning new things and getting into new styles of music. And I've never stopped playing guitar from that point till today. That's funny. I remember my first guitar lesson. So I got my guitar when I was 40. I actually right. had the same thing when we were a kid. We used to have one sitting around the house. And my mum was sort of like slightly musical background. I don't know how, how we end up with this guitar at home. And you'd same thing. I'd pick it up and just do that normal, you know, just strum it yeah. anywhere and uh, just sing over the top of it. So at 40, I decided I wanted to get a guitar because uh, I mentioned on an episode recently, I didn't want to die with the music in me, had all yeah. these tunes in my head. So I remember my first lesson and the guy said, just so show me what you know and we'll take it from there. I went, oh, this is a guitar. These things are strings and these things that he, they tighten them and loosen them. <laughs> right. So, you know, nothing, I went, absolutely nothing. And we just went from there and now it's been 16 years. I love it. It's yeah. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. I can't and imagine always, my life without it. Yeah. It was one of those instruments that I thought, well, it's hard to take a drum kit to the, someone's backyard barbecue or carry a piano. Mm. Whereas yeah. a guitar, you could take a camping, you do so many things with it. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so you've been doing that for 20 years. You're obviously really good at it. You're a professional musician. You tour around the country. You've probably done gigs yeah. overseas. Yeah. You are actually at the moment holding a flamingo guitar, but I read that you also do you play an Indian guitar. Um, yes, I, I used to play an instrument called a chaturanji, which is like a 22 string slide guitar. I kind of dabbled at it, but um, I kind of, my home is the flamenco guitar. Is that like That's the upright hosts. one? I was on your uh, Facebook page and there was an upright one. There was a guy and a girl standing there with these two big long things. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's called a tampura. So that's like a drone instrument that they play behind um, singing like an Indian classical music. So I've traveled to India four times. I've toured there and I've studied Indian classical music over there with a really top level musician. And yeah, done a few different things there. I'm so glad I got you on here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> no, this is so good because it's just, it's, it's different to a lot of people's path into podiatry and with what you're doing now. So when you, you finished, so obviously you were playing gigs while you were studying. Yeah. You graduated. Was there any thought that I'm going to do podiatry full time and give up music or were you always going to blend the two together? The thought did cross my mind. I did consider that, but then I thought I love music so much. I have offers to go to Spain to do concerts. I'm, I've got offers to tour with like the best guitar player in Indonesia and guitar players from Germany and America. So I went, I can't give this up. This is part of my life, this part of who yeah. I am. So I thought, how do I make podiatry, a, a career in podiatry, I should say, work for me um, and something that I can really um, throw myself into and have two passions instead of just one being music. And I thought, well, if I could work maybe part time in podiatry and maybe do some travel with podiatry and then the, the offer with locum work came up and it was kind of a snowball effect from there um just, just it took a while to kind of examine how could i put the two together it's taken me a couple of months to figure it out yeah i i really love the idea though that you're not just staying just in brisbane or just in sydney or just in melbourne you're actually going to be traveling between brisbane and adelaide two part-time permanent jobs you're just going to rotate between the two and therefore you're going to be doing gigs in Brisbane and gigs in Adelaide yeah. at the same time. Uh, is there yeah. time in between where you then you've allowed time to uh, tour around and do other things? Yeah, I might do, I might do little things like I might go to Sydney for a couple of shows or I might go to Melbourne for a couple of shows, that kind of thing on a weekend maybe. But um, yeah, podiatry is a big focus for me now. I definitely want to make sure I um, give that its due attention and energy now. So Oh, you definitely have yeah. to. You yeah. do. Yeah. It, and it is. It's one of those things. And this is why I did that episode about yeah, understanding biomechanics by using guitar chords, that it's just like music. Just because you understand chords doesn't mean you can play music. And yeah. even with podiatry, just because university teaches us the basics and a lot of employers need to understand that when a new graduate comes out, they know the chords. They just yeah. need to be shown how to actually turn that into music. Hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. So, at the moment, you're holding a flamingo guitar. Yep. Explain the difference for 
for those people that do not understand the difference because I didn't until I asked you before. Okay. <laughs> so this this is a, a flamenco guitar from the south of Spain. The, ta- the town it was built in is a town called Bias, which is just outside a town called Huelva, which is just outside Seville in the in the Andalusian bottom part of Spain. Yeah. And I actually traveled over to Spain and I met with the builder in his workshop there and picked this out. Um, when I was traveling over there. So what makes it different to maybe like other had types you played, of guitars? Had you played a flamenco guitar beforehand? Yes, I played a lot here in Australia beforehand. And before I saw him in his workshop, I went to maybe like five or six or maybe even 10 music. I can't remember, but there was quite, quite a few uh, music shops in Spain and I learned a little bit of Spanish to ask, you know, Puerto Toca yeah. la guitarra, por favor. Yeah. Can I play the guitar, please? Uh, I got to experiment and try a lot of instruments over there beforehand but this was the best one by far so okay so and how is playing that guitar different to playing so how is it different playing a flamenco guitar compared to playing a normal guitar could you play normal songs just on that guitar as well you could you could the the instrument's really set up for finger style playing so so it's designed really for you oh it's so cool (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's, so the strings are a little bit further apart, so your fingers can get in oh, between so you, the strings. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Yep. yep. Then like electric guitar or a steel string guitar, and um, the 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 action, which is the height of the strings off the neck of the guitar, yeah, that's a little bit lower than on other guitars. So you get that nice kind of crunchy sound that they they like to get in Spanish guitar yeah. playing. Um, the neck's a little bit wider um, to allow for the, the wider strings. The, the way the guitar is built, the top of the guitar is like a drum, basically. So it's got all these bracing on the top of the guitar that is this why they can it. hit it with the hand as well and they, they yes. create that beat sometimes yeah so which is called a golpe tap yeah oh that is pretty cool yeah so the back of the guitar and the sides is very light it's the opposite it's kind of like a resonance chamber and the top is really stiff so it's kind of like a guitar and a drum put together that's the best way i can explain it okay so if you were going to do a gig and it was with the band and you're just going to do normal music, you would grab your normal six string yep. and, and take that. Yeah. That guitar you have there, your flamenco guitar, would purely be for doing flamenco type music. Yep, 100%. Yep. Or sometimes okay. I play a little bit of jazz on it, but mostly flamenco guitar. Yeah. Okay. So, and this is where when I did the whole episode about understanding biomechanics using guitar chords, I never even thought about the different types of guitars. Or even the yeah. different styles of actually doing something. And if anyone here who anyone listening to this who plays a guitar will probably understand that just because you understand, remember reading somewhere and it said, if you can play three chords, you can play almost anything. That yeah. was a lie. <laughs> <laughs> you can play a lot of songs with those three chords. Yeah, definitely. That's true. Yeah. 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 I remember him saying, Yeah, I think it was Zig Ziglar. He said, You can play anything with three guitars. He said, Look what Elvis did with two. Yeah. Yeah. So it's true, but yeah. just because you can do so, do a D chord for me for a sec. Okay, now show me the variations and say what they are. Okay, so when someone first, so kind of going to what you were talking about before, when someone first learns the guitar, they learn that this is a D chord. Yes. And as you get better, you learn there's other ways to play a D chord. You can play a D chord up here, or you can play a D chord here, or you can play a D chord up here. Or you can play a D chord here. So actually, later on, you learn that every part of the guitar has a D chord that you can play. So different songs are going to use different versions of it. Okay. And then you've yeah. got your variations where you have a D suspended. So give us a D yeah. suspended. D seventh. Yeah. And so anyone listening to this, if you cannot hear there's a difference between those, you are tone deaf. <laughs> that would be my brother. I reckon my right. brother heard that okay. he'd go. It'll all sound the same. I don't think he'd tell the difference between a D and an A. It'd be the same. Right. Okay. So, but what I think is interesting with that, and this is the part when we talk about when a student graduates, the university teaches them how to do a D chord. Right. And they may actually show them how to do a D chord and then uh, may, maybe one other version, but they don't give them all the variations of how to actually do it. Yeah. It's not yeah. until they get a teacher. Yeah. And to me, that's your employer or that's a mentor or their conferences you go to that you start learning all these different variations. Yeah. So when you heard me talk about that on the podcast episode, 109, if people are wondering, but this episode is going to be better anyway. 
So the other one's now obsolete. So what was it that you heard me say that sort of made things click? It was the connecting the dots kind of analogy you use. Like you, you talked about like you can learn a D chord and then you can learn an A chord and then you can learn an E chord, but that's not the same as, you know, putting it together and connecting the dots. That was the thing that really I went, oh yeah, I can see how that relates to biomechanics totally. You can go, I can see the knees doing this or I can see that the, the foot's in this position or we got pronation in the midfoot, but it's the, like you said, it's the connecting of the dots between how is that influencing other aspects of their gait, for instance. So. That okay, so fun. instead of yeah. when you're at uni, because yeah. like I said, and this is a good part about having you on right now is because you have just left university. Yeah. So this is all now like really fresh in your mind of what you've been taught. Yeah. Now it's up for you. Have you actually started work yet? I've done some casual work um, yeah. since I've graduated, but no, I haven't really started a like a permanent part-time role yet. So I'm still getting there. Yeah. So this yeah. is what, why I thought it was great to get you on now. While this is still super, super fresh in your mind, you have all the basic chords and now you've got to start putting them yeah. all together. Have you thought about where you're going to then gather your information from, whether it's going to be mentors, attending conferences, reading journals, uh, courses? Probably all of the above. I'm pretty, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm pretty, uh, keen on continual growth and, and development. So I'm going to, I, I bought a book on biomechanics from the States, which I started to read, which was fantastic. And there's a lot of things in that, but yeah, I definitely want to do some, some webinars and short courses and go to some conferences and, and definitely mentoring is going to be a big part. Uh, yeah. it's just, I see it like playing the guitar. Um, when I first started playing the guitar, I was an amateur and I had to work really hard to get good. So I, I kind of look at it now that I'm a graduated novice. So I've got a lot of learning to do. Yeah. yeah, I think it's yeah. and it's one of those things too. Even playing the guitar, do you sort of look at yourself and go, "Oh, there's so much more I need to learn or improve." Like, mm. just play something again, really, really quick. That's really cool. First thing that pops in your head. If people say play something okay. that's really, really cool, just play sure. something. Okay. <laughs> So that would take me about five years to learn uh, <laughs> <laughs> if I could, if I could ever do it, because there, there's certain, um, well, I think anyone can learn anything if you put the time and effort into doing it. Yeah. So yeah. What, watching you play it out, my, my eyes were just flickering backwards and forwards, just going, Oh my God. But I know like it's anything, if you practice it, you're going to get better. So biomechanics yeah. is basically exactly the same. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Do you reckon you could teach that, that to, could you teach that to anybody? Uh, in time, yes. Once there's certain steps that have been okay, um, yeah. got together. Yeah. 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 So anybody could learn what you just did then if yeah. they, they learn the basic steps as they actually go through. Yes. Yeah. Even if they think they can't do it. Yeah. That's the biggest hurdle, I think. That's one thing I got told early on when I started guitar teaching was the hardest hurdle I'm ever going to overcome is convincing my students that they can do it. That, that, that doubt that they have themselves. And I've seen that over 20 years of teaching now that that's really a big hurdle. Just going, yes, you can do this. Like, don't give up. Just because you can't do it now doesn't mean you won't be able to do it. Yeah. And I think that's a fear sometimes with uh, new graduates when they come out is they've got the basics. They've learned the basic chords. The university sent them out. They may not have the best mentor and they go, oh, I'm being left behind by my friend who may have read one extra book who's now learned the D chord and a D suspended. And they think because they know the D suspended, they don't know how to do it, that they've now fallen so far behind. Right. But it's really, it's it's never too late to just get on that 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 path of learning more. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You said on one of your podcasts too about self-development outside clinic hours. Like if yeah. you want to get better biomechanics, why don't you work on it outside? You know, it's not, not just necessarily what you're doing with patients um, when you're working. And I just went, I really resonated with that too. I went, oh yeah, just like music, you know, you've got to practice this. Well, I remember my guitar teacher showing me how to do something. And he said, okay, I'll see you next week. Came back to him next week. We went over it again. He said, okay, so uh, pretty obvious you didn't do any practice whatsoever between me seeing you last time and today. And I could try and lie 
as much as I wanted. And initially, I used to lie. Oh, no, 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 I have been. He goes, yeah. Well, if you've been practicing every day as I told you to do, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> right. <Okay. laughs> he goes, because if you've been practicing that every day and that's you've actually gone backwards from what I showed you last week, which is what happens when you learn a skill and you don't use it. Yeah. And this is what some new graduates feel that they they learn the stuff at university, then they get a job just doing routine care and not doing any biomechanics. Oh, I've lost that skill. Oh, now I'm scared. Now I'm going to hide in a black a dark alley <laughs> or I'm going to yeah. leave. Yeah. Not realizing, well, you just could put the work back in. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. That's how I kind of felt about PNA surgery. I'm um, graduating. I didn't have a lot of exposure when I was at, at uni and I just went, no, I just have to take that challenge on and just get good at it. I'm just going to have to expose myself to it. So yeah. Yeah. That's on my list for this year to get good. Yeah. At. And I, I do. And I remember the guitar teacher when he would show me something and I would go away. And in my own time, I would practice and practice and practice. Then I'd jump on YouTube to see what I was practicing. And then I'd add something and I'd come right. back and go, show me what you did. And I'd do it. And then I'd add in that little extra thing. And you go, oh, who's been doing a bit of sneaky, a few sneaky lessons <laughs> behind my back? Or I'd have another friend who played the guitar and they just happened to be at my place. And I'd go, yeah. oh, this is what I'm learning at the moment. They go, oh, have you tried doing this? Yeah. I'd go, no, I haven't. And I'd do that. And straight away, he could tell that I had been doing something extra. Right. And I think employers pick up on that too. You can have, because I've had times where we've had two new graduates, they'll start around the same time. And you can see the one who's putting the extra hours in, in their own time compared to the one who is trying to live off of what they learned at university. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really obvious. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I can imagine. So starting podiatry or going through podiatry and just graduating, has it been, is there anything that when you went through the course, you felt that um, there were areas that you wish you'd learnt a little bit more about? Hmm. I th- yeah, biomechanics is a big one. Like I really tried to graft everything we were taught. I, I didn't think it was any reflection on the university. I think they did a great yeah. job with what they presented in the format of what you can do in a university degree. You, you can only do so much. Exactly. And 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 now getting in the real world and, and trying to connect the dots, like you said before, and just trying to see. So for instance, just we're doing a gait analysis to see the things that my lecturers saw, to see the things that other podiatrists see when they do a gait analysis that I might see 50% of the picture at the moment. That's yeah. one thing I, I wish maybe I'd probably had a little bit more practice at, but I know that I'm going to do a lot of that this year. So, But I do think it's one of the things when it comes to biomechanics, and I think the reason biomechanics is so important in podiatry, and you don't need to be an expert. So, for example, I can pick up a guitar and I can play a certain amount of songs. I'm very entertaining in a backyard barbecue. I tell a lot of jokes while I'm doing it, and everyone knows I'm not a professional, but I don't pretend to be. So I think when you first graduate, you got to realize that you're not a f- flamenco guitar player. Yeah, exactly. You got to know where your yep. limitations are, but you yeah. know if you yep. put the work in, you you will actually yeah. get better. Yeah. But I think the power of biomechanics is everything else in podiatry relates to it. Yeah. Even the people that go, yeah. oh no, I just want to work in high risk feet. Understand mm-hmm. biomechanics, you'll be better at it. Yeah, hundred percent. I just want to work, yeah diabetes, or I just want to do routine foot care. Understand biomechanics, and that will make you better at that. Yeah, 100%. So, 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 so it'd be like, oh, I want to learn how to play a flamenco guitar, but I don't want to learn the D chord. Yeah. Is that, going to, <laughs> is that going to affect me in any way? Yes, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it would. Like if there were certain, yeah. and I think with certain parts of biomechanics, you've got to learn all the basics of biomechanics, then be able to, like you said, know how to put them together. If you were playing a, the guitar and said, no, nah, I'd, yeah, duh, I'm not really interested in the C chord. I've always had a thing against it. So yeah. uh, let's let's not do that. But I still yeah. want to be able to play music. Yeah, it's that's a challenging, challenging one to overcome. Luckily, I've never faced that in 20 years of teaching. So I hope that never walks through the door, but it might. <laughs> yeah, but I reckon yeah. it's like I understand when we go to uni, they're gonna teach us all the chords. They're gonna yeah. teach us the basics. Yeah. But unfortunately, when some people get out, like I said, if they're not exposed to biomechanics, they start. Oh, they yeah, don't know right. how. To, well, if you haven't picked the guitar up, if you only just learned how to play and then pick it up for five years, and someone says, "Show us a G chord," you'd be going, "Hang on, hang on, let me." Yeah. How's that going? And then also, yeah. your fingers don't work. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we have to play. 
Definitely. Give an example because this would be good for the video. Uh, like I know with my hands, one hand spreads out and my hand that I play guitar has a lot more reach to it. Yeah. I left because I play left handed. That's the other interesting part to tell people is you can play left and right handed. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's both types. Yeah. So put your hands out for a sec. Do one spread a lot more than the other, or you play music, you play, yeah, yours are pretty even. Yeah. I got about a almost 180 degree spread between the thumb and the little finger. Wow. Yeah. All right. I'm going to get mine here. Oh. And my thumb on my left, this is my left hand, goes back 90 degrees from playing the guitar. So it's it's adapted my anatomy <laughs> playing the guitar. It's actually changed it. That is interesting. Yeah. I didn't. Well, I know I knew it yeah. did that with the with the reach, but I didn't realize yeah. your the actual thumb itself had. Yeah, yeah, it goes back 90 degrees. As the other one doesn't do it. No, just just on my left hand from pushing on the back of the neck for 30 years. That's amazing. So let's get back onto your. Uh, podiatry and moving from town to town was that your idea that you were going to go from brisbane to adelaide or did it sort of just present itself um it kind of actually presented itself i i finished uni and i called up a pod a and just said hey guys I'm, I'm a new grad what are we allowed to do as new grads until our registration comes in i just want to make sure i'm not crossing any lines i'm not supposed yeah. to and just do what i need to do and they were really helpful and um what was they, the advice they gave you out of curiosity the advice they gave me was to, you can work under supervision, but only on private paying um, clients. You can't work with any chronic disease management plan clients okay. or DVA. You can't do anything high risk yet because you haven't got your registration. You can only work with those who are low risk where you've got a podiatrist um, in the same, uh, who's working on the same facility with you who can sign off and just check everything that you're doing. So it's kind of still like that supervised model. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so, then at the end of the conversation with them, they said, just out of interest, what, if, what did you do? Because you sound a little bit older than our <laughs> other people who've graduated, some, some people have graduated uni. And I said, well, I've been a professional musician for 20 years. And the, the lady I was talking with on there said, oh, you have to talk to Reed, Reed um, down in, in Adelaide. And um, I think you guys would really get along. So I just went, oh, that's nice. Oh, thank you. And then I kind of just moved on and didn't really think too much about it. And then the very next day, I got a call from Reed from South Australia going, hey, do you want to come on down and do some work in my clinic? And yeah. he's he's been a musician himself and he um, he kind of owns a practice at Clare Valley, uh, just north of Adelaide now. And and yeah, I'm just very grateful for that opportunity. So. Yeah, I had a friend who was a lawyer and he was we met him at university and he was a guitar player as well. And I remember him coming up to Cairns one day and with the law firm that he was working for, they said, oh, did you go up to Cairns to do something? Anyway, he, when he's arriving, he phones me and says, oh, by the way, I'm going to be doing a gig at, you know, say, the Red Beret Hotel. I went, oh, yeah. okay. So I was talking to him afterwards. I said, weren't you coming up here to do law work? He says, yeah, but because I knew I was coming up here and I had a couple of weeks warning, I just rang a pile of the pubs around and just said, hey, are you looking for a performer on, on Thursday night? Yeah. And then, well, yeah, he said, so I picked up an extra 200 bucks. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. didn't, I thought, oh, wow, that is, that's pretty cool that you can just, you can just take another skill that you have and just fit it. And he does the same thing. I think he still plays a guitar now. Oh, right. Okay. Great. So, so I just think, I don't know. I think it's, I think if you've got a passion or something that you're doing coming into Padai, especially you being a mature age student. Yeah. Was that also hard to making that decision? How old are you now? Uh, I'm going to be 39 next month. Okay. So, so was that, yeah. so therefore you were like 35 when you yeah. decided that, yeah. okay, now I'm going to be a podiatrist. Yeah. Was that, was it a hard decision to make at that age? Yeah, because music's all I've ever known. Um, like I, I finished high school and went straight, like I think within a year or so, I went to the conservatorium of music and did my first degree there. And then, done a lot of things in music and film scoring and lecturing and teaching and performing. So I knew that world really well. It was, it was a really big change and going through and studying, I didn't have a natural inclination to the kind of left, you know, left brain kind of um, scientific thinking. So that, yeah. that was really, I had to adapt and change a lot in those four years. So, but it's been a really amazing journey. I've really, been, I've really enjoyed it. Oh, it sounds like it's been fun. Yeah. When you went through podiatry, and I've heard some recent graduates talk about it, that their lecturers will give them a bit of guidance on 
you know, what to expect when they graduate and where to work and career advice. When you were at the conservatorium and you were graduating, were the lecturers there telling you, oh, by the way, there's no money in music, you're never going to be able to buy a house? No. What, what's the no. thinking of musicians <laughs> when they're coming out? Because like we we sitting on the sidelines watching people playing music uh, at the level that you do and the touring around that you've done, you just expect you're living this amazing lifestyle. You've got you know, women throwing their bras at you when you're on stage and you're going to settle down. And so but what's the reality of it all? The reality is that there's a small percentage of artists who live a, a comfortable life from it, yeah. which, yeah, I, I'm, you know, and they're, they're, a lot of them are household names in the different music genres that they play in. Um, and there's a lot of the rest of us who can work very hard and, you know, can make a kind of okay living. I just found the insecurity of it financially was just too much in the end. It um, basically needed to have something that would support my life and give me more financial stability. There was a lot of hours in the day that I wanted to work that I couldn't yeah. work being a performer, like daytime hours. And I couldn't get guitar students then. I couldn't get gigs then like, unless it's, um, you know, corporate events and things like that. So yeah, podiatry was just a really good fit for that space. Yeah. Okay. Did COVID make you realize that podiatry was a good choice? Yes. Yeah. Because I was going to assume during, there was a certain period there where there were no gigs. Yes. And even the even the professionals yeah. were complaining that yes. they were losing houses and having cars repossessed because yeah. they just thought that money was always going to be coming in. So yeah. was that a real eye-opener that it was good to have a second profession? 100%. And I felt really lucky, not, not because it was COVID, but just while COVID was on that I was doing something that was positive for my future uh, and growing and developing um, while there was no no gigs happening. Luckily, with my guitar teaching, I moved to online teaching at the start of okay. COVID. So that actually grew my business because everyone was online. Everyone discovered what this thing called Zoom is. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was really what's good. Actually, my school improved during that time. So, well, it was how yeah. the twelve week podiatry business reboot kicked off. It was exactly it was exactly that. COVID hit. Everyone had shut down. Had people panicking about certain things, and somebody said to me, "Why don't you put something together and just do it online?" Yep. Oh, okay. And so I, I just picked the the main areas that I think if you want to have a successful business, these are the areas you really need to work on. Really, I don't know why I use the word reboot because it, it sounds like you you already had a business that failed and then you're rebooting it. But it right. could be yeah, even if you're just starting out. But yeah. yeah, so Zoom and COVID on that side of things was actually quite good for me as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I did have another question about, damn it. Forgot what I was going to ask. That's right. I can edit this off the podcast. The video yeah. will still just be on here. Yep. Um, yep. It was around the COVID thing. No, totally threw me. You see, I interrupted myself. That's the problem. I interrupted myself with another story that had nothing yep. to do with it. And I oh, so with um yeah so during COVID when you couldn't work, and then you were studying podiatry. I don't know, were you getting any feedback from the universities about COVID or what was going to happen? Because you would have been about halfway through your course. Well, actually, you would have mm. probably been just finished your first year going into your second year. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was second year that it hit. So obviously the music dried up, that you couldn't do that. Yeah. You moved a little, you moved to online. Yeah. Were the lecturers giving you much advice on what was happening in the profession with COVID at all? There was some talk about the growth of telehealth. That was the okay. main thing that we, we started doing a little bit of telehealth modules and training and things like that, which was good, was really good. I really- oh, So they, uh, they, started, they started introducing that? Yeah, yeah. We oh, had good. like a compulsory module we had to do on telehealth and, um, Zoom, and using Zoom with clients and things like that. And obviously with me teaching online, I already was right across Zoom, but it was still really, really helpful. And that's a space that I'm still actually really keen on to see how that changes. Um, now going forward to see if that becomes a thing in podiatry. I'm really fascinated to see if that develops. So. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people that are initially were doing a lot more telehealth and as things have gotten slowly back to normal, they've yeah. slowly let that go away. But I know yeah. other people that are dietitians, psychologists that have actually stepped that up even further. Even though right. everything's back to normal, they found yeah. a lot of their clients would rather, uh, because I do all my coaching stuff, 
uh, online using Zoom, yeah. and it's it's great. I don't know, I don't know how to do it any other way. Yeah, but I know some uh, there's certain aspects of podiatry where we you probably don't need to have the patient in the room with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's definitely room for it. I think. Like I was thinking, like if someone had an ankle sprain or someone's got some musculoskeletal injury or they're marathon training and they want advice, you know, things like that, maybe. So with um, if people wanted to, because I know when we used to have our Christmas parties, we used to always have music. So initially I used to bring in my guitar teacher until I got a guitar, then him and I would do it together. Yep. So at all of our Christmas parties, we always had live music. If any podiatrist wanted to reach out to you and see whether you played at a Christmas party or any other gig, what's the best way of getting hold of you? Uh, they can go to my website. So that's www.bartstenhouse.com and all my contact details are up there and they can watch videos and read bios and yeah and watch interviews on the abc and things like that so yeah and you don't have a big yeah. ponytail now no it's all gone like so I, did that I come off of, because yeah. you graduated you said ponytails off or did you do that a while back no i did that a while back i just thought no i'm, I'm moving into the health sphere i feel like it's uh <laughs> it's time to, it's time to get with the trend <laughs> i like yeah, it now it's good it's much easier to maintain so yeah, I wasn't quite sure when I when I went to your website and I have a look at it. I go, yeah, you look like a musician. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then you're jumping on there now, going, oh, look at you now. You look so clean cut. Oh, sorry to disappoint you, Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for I was waiting for the big scraggly beard that you may have like trying to grow that over the holiday period, and uh, yeah, you have the little um, what was that little bead at the front? You seen someone where they uh, they braid the front of their, their little goatee? Yep. Yeah, 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 I've seen that a few times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm glad you did do that. So, is there anything else you want to share about yourself, your career, or podiatry uh, before we wrap up at all? Um, probably just one thing, actually. I would just encourage, as someone who stepped out of the arts, or not really out of it, but alongside it, um, yeah, and and gone into podiatry, I would actually just really encourage anyone in the arts if they're looking for another kind of skill set another career um uh, possibility to consider podiatry i think it's a fantastic profession so it's, it's, it, I, I found it's been really flexible and and there's a there's a lot of opportunity to do it alongside anything artistic that you're trying to do so i'd try and encourage some people in the art world maybe to consider working in podiatry so. yeah and there are people that listen to this podcast who are not podiatrists they, yeah. find, they actually find the world of podiatry really interesting. Yeah. And there was a quote that I saw you posted on Facebook and it said, you learn nothing from life if you think you're right all the time. Yeah. And when I saw that you posted that and I thought, wow, that really relates to what we're talking about now is because I do know when some new graduates finish and they've, depending on who the lecturers were, but when they learn biomechanics, they think they know it all already. Yeah. And yeah. they don't want to be told by somebody who's been out for 20 or 30 years, oh, yeah, but you're old and crusty. You only own all the old stuff. You don't understand all the new stuff that we've just learned. And I think it's really important. If, if you think you're right all the time, then you've got to open your mind up to yeah, learning 100%. new stuff. Yeah. That's one of, been one of the blessings of music, I guess, is it's so humbling constantly because anytime you think, hey, I'm so great, there's another great, great guitar player you go see and you go, oh, I can't do what he does <laughs> or singer or, or piano player or anything. And a lot of the musicians I've been blessed to work with, it's been um, very inspiring, but also humbling watching their great talent and going, well, I can't do that. I can't do that. So it's a constant reminder of that. We're always a balance of what we can do and what we can't do. So, so have you, yeah, um, yeah do you often come across guitar players now that you watch and go, oh my God, they're good? All the time. All the time? Yeah. 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 I, I agree overseas. all the time because most people are better. But so even at, even at your level of guitar playing, you still see so many other people. What What's the difference? Yeah. What makes them better? Um, a certain style of guitar playing that I can't play. Um, they might have a command of rhythm in a certain way that I, I can't, um, I'm not maybe not able to do that particular thing. It might be the way they compose a song and I go, oh, wow, that's so fascinating. So even for me as a composer and songwriter, I go, oh, I never thought of that. That's really fantastic. Wish I wrote that song. So yeah. things like that. Okay. And I think that relates to biomechanics as well. Yeah. There's always going to be the person that just sees things that you cannot see. And it doesn't mean that you're no good. It just means that they see things. There'll be certain things that you probably do that may be better than them. Yeah. Like yeah. I actually, like I always found biomechanics 
easy to understand, and this will sound funny because my background was art. I, I, I was going to be an art teacher. All right. So, and I did art all through school. So I used to just see things in 3D. So when I looked at a person's foot, I would see what I'm looking at, but I could, it was almost like I had X-ray vision. I could see through it to the other side. And every time anything was moving, I, I could just picture these images going around in my head. And I found that helped me understand biomechanics right. a lot easier by not just seeing things in two dimensions. Right. That makes that makes a lot of sense. So if I was so and therefore when I was with a patient or I was checking something out, there'd be certain things that I could pick up really quick. Whereas there was a new graduate who just started with me, they go, How did you how did you see that or how did you understand that? But over time they would with everything, it was just practice. The more they did it, the the better they got. Right. Yeah, great. I'll have to do so that do this you, year. So do you see anybody playing a guitar, doing something, you go, oh, wow, that's great. And then you go home and you go, I'm going to practice that? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah. And then <laughs> yeah. a few times, there'll be, there's probably certain times, no matter how many times you practice it, you just can't get it. Yeah, there's certain things. It might be a tempo thing, might be a speed thing. Um, it might be a certain way of using scales or something if I'm improvising that they just have a knowledge in an area that I'm like, I've got to go study that before I can try and apply that. Yeah. Okay. But it doesn't make you want to give the guitar up, does it? No, I love it too much. It yeah. inspires me. And I've come to, as someone said to me once, they said, I, I've never thought of quitting or anything like that, but they said, you've come so far with music, you can't quit. You know, like you've got to keep going with it. You've done so much, so keep going. So um, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, my wife thought I was going to give up the guitar because she bought my first one. She thought right. I'd give it away after about six weeks. So 16, yeah, 16 years later and four more guitars. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's one of, and it's still it's one of those things. I'm not very good, but I've come too far to give it away now. I just didn't. Yeah. I just enjoy um, being yeah. at the level that I'm at, knowing that I can constantly just keep getting better. But I'm just doing it at my own pace. That's the beauty of it is that you can the guitar or any musical instrument can be anything you want it to be. So I say to my students, like if you just want to sit around a campfire and play a few songs, great, do that, enjoy it. And there's other people like myself where we want it to be a massive part of our life. So it, you can find all kind of things in between those two places. And I think yeah. the really key thing I've taken away from this conversation with you is you love what you're doing as a guitar player, which is why you'll never give it up. Yeah. And I think it's really important for anyone that's doing podiatry is to find an aspect of podiatry that you love. Do it more, yeah. Do it as often as you can. Get better at it, and then you'll never want to quit podiatry. No matter what else is yeah. going on, yeah. No matter what patient comes in, or if you had a bad day, or you're not doing, you might be working for somebody else. You're not really loving the job, but if there's certain parts of podiatry you've learned to love, you won't quit. And it's a big part of this podcast at the moment is trying to keep as many new graduates, recent graduates, and even us crusty old buggers in the profession for as long as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I plan to do it for my whole working life now. So yeah, oh, good. I'll be one of those. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be one of those. Yeah. So do you have any parting words before we finish up? No, just thank you so much for having me on board. It's been amazing to chat with you and thanks for the opportunity. No, it's great. Do you want to play something to, uh, to end with you? I'll just let sure. you, I'm going to let you play, play a song and then yep. I'll, I'll just end the recordings, but don't, don't disappear. Cause I'll talk to you afterwards. Okay. Sure. So no problem. Play me, play me something really cool. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.